If you ask anyone to draw a scientist, there is a good chance that you will end up with the drawing of a person wearing a lab coat. In fact, there is something called the Draw a Scientist Test, which was designed by a researcher named David Wade Chambers and has been used since 1983 to test how early children develop stereotypes about scientists. The drawings that kids make are analyzed for indicators such as symbols of research and technology, eyeglasses, facial hair, and of course, the lab coat. Today, I want to tell you a little bit about science, but most importantly, I want to talk about the people doing science. I want to give you a glimpse of what is actually beneath this lab coat. So let me take this off. First off, actually, a good number of us don't really wear lab coats to work. I do because I study biology and I do experiments. But if you talk to theoretical physicists, they don't really have to worry about getting stained by dark matter or getting covered in black hole hair. <laughs> Computer scientists can usually compile their code, however dirty, without a smudge. And if you talk to field ecologists, or geologists, they will probably trade a lab coat any day for some cargo pants and a good pair of hiking shoes. And these are just a few of many other examples. But there is still a metaphorical lab coat in the way that we all act, work, and think. As scientists, we're expected to know things. We're expected to have answers to the many questions that humanity has. But the truth is, one of the main character traits of scientists is doubt. We are literally paid to doubt. One of the foundations of research is peer review, meaning that before somebody's research actually gets published, it has to be verified and scrutinized by several experts from the field who question every experiment, every step of the reasoning, every equation, every line of code. When we start our new project, our first job is to read all the literature that has been written by people before us on our specific topics and to read this critically, which means we don't just have to question the research, even established research. We also have to make sure that we read all the articles that may matter to us. And we need to make sure that we don't overlook one article somewhere that may be of crucial value to us. This is especially important and at the same time difficult considering the volumes of research currently being produced. An analysis that was published in 2014 in the journal Research Trends showed that for the year 2013 alone, across all research fields, more than 2.4 million articles had been published. This is a staggering number and it's still growing, doubling approximately every nine years. When we finally get to start our own work and experiments, again, we are expected to doubt everything, every result that we get, when we do get results. Because the reality is, science actually involves a lot of failure. So much failure. We talk about the results and we publish big advances, but we don't really discuss all the experiments that went nowhere, all the calculations that took us on the wrong track all the hours spent staring at a blank screen or blackboard trying to find the right angle to attack a problem. This means a lot of doubt. And all this doubt is only one short step away from doubting ourselves. And many of us actually do take that step. You see, scientists are very passionate about their work and we're very involved in it. So more often than not, we take, science, we take failure very personally. This is part of something called imposter syndrome. The idea that somehow we don't really belong here, that we got here by mistake, and at some point someone will discover us for the fraud that we are. Right now. <laughs> Because of this discrepancy between who we think we are and who we think we should be, imposter syndrome can become even worse for people from minority groups. If you are a woman or a person of color or an LGBTQ person, 
then there are a few more checkboxes that you cannot check in the list of stereotypes about scientists. And that can make you feel even more an outsider. When you have imposter syndrome, the lab coat can become much more than a piece of protecting equipment. It becomes a disguise to hide who we think we truly are. And it can help assert our credibility when we don't think we have any with our colleagues and our supervisor. In short, it becomes a kind of shield. The sad thing is, a lot of us know about imposter syndrome, but we have a hard time admitting it, and not to ourselves, and certainly not to others. But living with so much doubt can become crippling and significantly affect our mental health to the point of anxiety and depression. There has been a recent flourish of studies published both in science journals and in regular news outlets, shedding some light on the prevalence of mental health issues in academia. In fact, last year, a study published by the University of Ghent in Belgium surveyed a population of PhD students, and they found that half of the students actually exhibited at least two symptoms of poor mental health, and one third of the students exhibited four or more symptoms of poor mental health, which was putting them at risk of having or developing a mental illness. And of course, this does, this does not magically stop once you defend your thesis and graduate. The doctor title is not a cure for imposter syndrome, so postdoctoral researchers and faculty even are not immune to it. A, number, a growing number of universities now provide good quality counseling services, and that's very commendable. But there is still, unfortunately, some stigma associated with mental illness, which makes it hard for people to come forward and talk openly about it. There is fear of seeming weak and incompetent, and ultimately of damaging one's career further down the line. I am a very lucky person because people talk to me, and I have been the recipient of many stories and confessions. I did spend many late nights in the lab, hiding so that my colleagues wouldn't see me in case I would fail my experiments. I still cry sometimes when I fail an experiment that took weeks or months of work, or worse, when I repeat it and I get different results every time. But knowing that some of my friends were going through the same difficulties and had similar coping strategies was a huge help. Some very talented people around me have faced doubt and difficulties and depression, sometimes for years, entirely alone, not talking about it, until at one point they could not hold it anymore and they finally confided in someone. The sad thing is, to them, it probably seemed like a big failure when the fact of talking actually takes enormous courage and having kept things together for so long is a testimony to their strength and resilience. My hope with this talk is to spark some conversations. First off, between scientists and the public. Maybe this way we can dispel some of the stereotypes that are still floating around by shedding some light on who we are and how we work. We can show a truer image of what science and scientists are. The good news is that uh, draw a scientist test that I mentioned earlier, over the course of three and a half decades has shown that some of the stereotypes have been receding. Children now draw more women, more people of color, and less lab coats. Maybe this can also help fight some of the distrust against science that has developed in some parts of the world recently. Science is made by passionate and creative people, but most importantly, people who question everything that they do first and foremost, their own work. People who may not be completely infallible, but who will strive very, very hard to pursue and find and disseminate the truth. And second, I'm hoping that we start conversations among scientists ourselves. Science is amazing. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's probably one of the best jobs in the world, but it can be a very lonely endeavor, even in a team especially in a team. We all want to do our best, and we sometimes put enormous pressure on ourselves so that we don't disappoint and let down our colleagues and our supervisors. 
But there is comfort in knowing that we fight the same battles and we should be more supportive of each other. After all, we're here to do science, good science, not to win an episode of Survivor. But in order to do that, we need to learn to let our guards down a little and to trust each other. In short, we need to learn to take off our lab coats sometimes. Thank you.